Okay. Uh, this go, go ahead. This stems from the question I asked Derek yesterday. I asked uh, what he thought deployment systems should look like. So I started thinking a little bit about it. Uh, I think that the world needs uh, better build systems, and I'm going to explain why I use the word build instead. Uh, but to start with, workload is really all that matters. The only reason we exist in this industry, the only reason that we work, is to put a workload on a machine that computes, uh, converts energy to heat. Uh, and what I'm going to argue in this is that a deployment is actually build, and we should start thinking of deployment systems as build systems. But more correctly, what I'm going to say is, Deployment is actually equal to the derivative of build with respect to T. So, and where T is the commit hash. So instead of thinking about time as a, you know, uh, the number of vibrations of a cesium-238 atom, it's actually the commit hashes, there my screen went, it's actually the commit hashes that in, uh, introduce change um, in a system. Here we go, cool. So in order to do this, I think that we need to model everything. Uh, and within practical limits, of course, because what's the point of modeling gas atoms if you have the ideal gas law? But a sort of demo model might look something like this, and I separated these out because the workload is the thing that matters, but underneath it is the topology that is required to operate that workload, all the way from runtime environment down to the physical, actually like layer zero stuff with regulatory and governance, and I, okay. If you make a change to that in certain areas of that dependency graph, you, uh, you can see that, you know, we have uh, some T plus N uh, state of the entire uh, topological model of the workload, it's required. And so what we end up with is a system that looks like you go from model T to model T plus N, and then what you have is the derivative of M as respect to T is actually just the changes that are required to actually institute that model or to uh, apply that model. So if you think about a, a, what a build system does, a build system takes model T at a certain time and converts it to a bunch of artifacts, right? But it doesn't really concern itself with what happens after, as time changes, as new commits occur. Usually what you end up doing is building a bunch of, um, a bunch of artifacts that you then like package into a deployment system, right? Like Kubernetes or something else. But we aren't taking into account the, the fact that what we're really doing is building those artifacts, composing them, constructing them on a machine at the end goal that we want, which is really just a build operation. Okay, so why would this be valuable? What would we get out of it? Uh, we can turn things into an existing problem. Uh, if you operate in topologies or trees or graphs or anything, you can use mathematical constructs, manifold surfaces, there is things like that. You could use, you know, uh, physics concepts and things. You can run simulations because if you have the dependency graph of everything the workload requires, why couldn't you build a simulating environment to actually test it? You can do predictions just like we can do in other mathematical model con uh, systems. We can predict what the future T value of a model will be. Uh, you can create reproducibility because you have all of the components required to compute. Uh, and you can optimize vertical integration. This is an interesting one, be, and I only have a few seconds left, but imagine having a workload that requires a particular ASIC that you want to actually materialize an FPGA into. You would know what exactly the components of that FPGA are because you have the full tree. And I'll end with, it doesn't matter what you build, it matters how you build it. <laughs> okay, great. Um, yeah, I'm here to tell you about Prequel, uh, a modern language for transforming data. I think of it as the love child of SQL and dplyr or, or pandas. And um, basically, because why in 2023 are we still writing um, code like in to get data that SQL that looks like COBOL? Um, you know, we've learned a lot about programming languages um, in the um, in the last 40 years. So. Um, Prequel kind of um, is a so developer tool to make developers more um, productive. Um, we've seen quite a lot of uh, rapid adoption in stars on, on GitHub. Um, the first spike there in January last year was basically just the white paper, which got um, on Hacker News. And um, we, since then, we've spent a year building it. And I think it's, um, it's pretty cool already what you can do with it. Um, so basically, it's a... a um, yeah, pipeline relational query language. It transpiles to, to SQL, and it's a bunch of transforms. You can group transforms together either with a pipe symbol or with a new line. And um, yeah, so you can like you know if you see it, you take um, uncomment lines on the left, the prequel, and it transpiles to SQL on the right. And as Andrew was saying yesterday, you know we think the it's sort of it compiles at per keystroke, and you get errors. So that for that quick loop when you kind of try and see your uh, SQL develop um, quickly. Um, so, you know, here it's sort of not 
that much uh, benefit yet. Um, but I think, for example, here as we see, like we derive the field gross price, which is unit price times by 1.25. Um, and now if you want to filter on that field in normal SQL, you know, you're not allowed to um, access the, that alias. So um, prequel will wrap that in a, in a CTE for you so you can use um, uh, can use that. Um, also, then I'm going to skip. So we've got um, a couple of modern just quality of life improvements for developers to work with. So for example, here we've got um, uh, date literals, got f strings for um, coalesce. Um, we've got a, a null coalesce operator um, with the double equals and you can, you know, and numerals, you can kind of make them readable. So I think it's just really aimed at um, developer productivity. So I'm just going to see if I can just do some um, Thing quickly here and one of the main things is that we're really looking for composability uh take three while wow. um, live demos oh, this one here okay and so we can look at the output here um and what you can do is like yeah we want composability of programming language so you can take this thing out here for example at the bottom and um uh, paste that here Oop. what did i do oh. Oh, okay, um, let's skip up here the final slide. Basically, we, we paste that out and, and you func um, factor it out into a function. And now we've got a, um, that same thing as a, a function that you can reuse in, in other things. So you can say, take the top three per group or take the top one um, per group. So bringing kind of um, more features um, of, that we used to in other programming language to, to working with data um, for, for data scientists and analysts. Okay, yeah. if you want to find out more, I'm speaking at the uh, Cape Town Python user group next Saturday, the 18th, and then there will also be a talk at Subsurface Live on the 1st of, of March, will there be a longer version? Yeah. Yay! Thanks. Thanks. Hey, folks. My name is Pavel. I I'm a database geek uh, building a narrow cloud infrastructure for business integration. So today I'll talk to you about improving the resiliency of APIs. There's this concept called idempotency. Who here has heard about idempotent APIs? Most of the room. Who here has implemented an idempotent API? A good chunk of the room, probably at least a third. Uh, great. So idempotency, what is it? It's this mathematics term that we've misappropriated um, and applied to um, software systems. Um, which I'll try and illustrate with a story uh, because we have all the time. So imagine um, you are desperate for some bubble gum and your friend is out of the shops and you really have to get some gum. It's really important to your life. So what do you do? You call up your friend and ask him or her to get you some. As you do so, your call terminates. Mobile network error, whatever. So maybe you send him a text message to do so. Um, do you think that the chances are good you might end up with zero, one, or more than two um, packets of bubble gum when they return. Any idea? Zero, one, two, three, N? Okay, so comp people are really good at knowing what you mean. So if your friend uh, never got the message at all, they might not get you anything. But if they got two messages, they'll probably infer that the second message was related to the first and only bring you home one packet of gum instead of a packet getting stuck in a loop and applying some side effect a hundred times. So how might we um, do that? How might we apply this in software? The key idea is that um, for non-mutating APRs, you can generally retry the operation without actually worrying about any side effects. You might observe different answers to your repeated questions, um, even when the question doesn't change. That's generally okay. And dealing with consistency is the subject of a completely different talk. Um, however, in order for us to make um, the client uh, be more resilient to loss of messages and achieve this ideal property that we want the effect of that command to be applied exactly once, um, people have tried various things. Um, way back at the dawn of distributed systems, um, some people thought that distributed transactions were going to be a good idea and there are things like two-phase commits they don't really scale to very large systems. Um, so when we want to apply this um, behavior of one, exactly once processing 
in loosely coupled distributed systems, we can reach for an importance e-tokens. That is one pattern that's being applied in um, large-scale APIs. So the key idea there is that we generate a small bit of um, unique information that we attach to every mutating request. We flow that bit, bit of information um, through to the core persistence engine where the mutating command takes place. And we persisted conditional on the fact that that command actually uh, got applied to the underlying infrastructure. We still have to make another small change on the right path of our application that checks on receipt of a new command whether we have seen this idempotency token before. And if we do so, the complexity mostly lies around um, coming up with decent um, semantics for uh, returning a meaningful response to that client when um, we detect that this has already happened. Thank you very much. Um, if you want to learn more, um, there are some extra resources out on the internet. My um, ex-colleague and um, ex-Capetonian, Malcolm Featonby, has written what I think is the definitive article on the subject on the Amazon Builders Library. Hi, folks. Yeah, myself, Santosh. Uh, I don't have any slides to show or anything. I just want to share my experience. Uh, I see that many of you people here are hardcore, low-level programming guys, very good at that. I come from a place where we do more, most of the application programming, where at the application layer, how we consume the data. So basically, I wanted to share here how we look data as. Right, so there are many use cases. There are many ways the data can be consumed or used. Okay, so based on what we have experienced, we group the data itself as four categories. Okay, based on my theory is this. The data which is very short lived. Okay, the lifespan of the data is very less. Take for example, you are storing some information related to the performance. You want to show, store the TPS information, what is the count for per second, per limit, right? So those kind of information, it is not really necessary for us to use some kind of a database or anything like that, right? I can do it in memory itself or use some flash data store, which can be accessed fast because it changes fast, right? <clears throat> so then we have something called a static data which has less frequently changeable. Okay, take for example, your account information, user information, which are very rarely ch share, uh, changing. So this kind of data, we usually store it in RDBMS kind of database where you get the storage available. And also there are very good SQL queries available to retrieve the data as and when it is required. The third form of data, we call it as transactional information. Okay, so these transactional informations are the life cycle of a particular transaction. Okay, so you insert the data, you get the data, transaction is initiated, then there is modifications to those transactions, right? You update, you make certain modifications to the data. Then there is a final stage where you actually complete the transaction. And for these kind of things, we use something called as OLTP kind of database. Yeah, so these are online transactional processing. This is where majority of the challenges occur because you need to get the performance in transactional database. And the final form of the database uh, data that we look at it is the finished data. In the sense, your transaction is completed, you have stale data available, you push it into a store where it is like a large amount of data is stored, especially like S3 or Data Lake or Elastic databases, which is predominantly used for your analytics and reporting. Right. So this is where I categorize the data that is there at the application layer into groups. Okay. This is my definition. I don't, we don't have any specific here. Short lived, transactional, static data, and then the finished data for performance. This one. Yeah. Thanks. That was it. Thank It's always 50-50 if that's going to work on Linux. Anyway, I was going to rant you for three minutes about everyone's favorite distributed system, Kubernetes, Docker, all that stuff. But to be honest, I'd be here the whole day. Instead, I'm going to chat a little bit about um, Tiger Beetle, what we're doing for our serverless infrastructure. This demo is probably going to fail. We, who here has heard of Secure Boot? Hands up. Okay, 
few people. Secure Boot basically was Microsoft's attempt to try and lock down your computer. That's the uncharitable interpretation. The charitable interpretation is the trying to build a trusted computing base that you can do all sorts of cool things like remote attestation and validating that the code running on the computer is from who they say it is. Well, how does this tie into running things on cloud providers, AWS, EC2, or the like? Well, it turns out that say you have a kernel, say you have a init RAM FS, say you have a kernel command line, you can actually assemble these into a single image, something called a UKI. Uh, you can then take this UKI, sign it with secure boot keys that you control, big caveat there, embed those secure boot keys into your AMI that you're actually running on AWS or do the same thing for any other cloud provider. And all of a sudden you have an end-to-end -end verified chain that not only protects you against certain uh, attacks on the security side of things, but also protects you against things like bit flips. Because when an image starts up, it verifies the whole image. If you want to load things that are bigger, you can just do some simple hash chaining, maybe load a, um, root FS from disk, you can just take the hash of it before loading it into memory and be sure that it is what you think it is. That's what this is doing over here. This is a series of shell scripts hacked together. I know some people don't have the highest opinion of shell scripts. Personally, I love them. Andrew said, if there's any branching logic, it probably belongs in a real programming language. I said, I think the opposite. Um, so yeah, um, this has just built Tiger Beetle's uh, serverless or soon to be serverless infrastructure image. Um, you've probably been staring at that waiting for import to complete screen. So that's just the final step of actually pulling it into AMI, pulling it in as an AMI. I know there's some people from AWS here. So uh, if you could speed up that step, it would really be appreciated. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, I want to talk about um, running a company based on OSS. Um, it is not easy. I've been very privileged to have raised around $300 million in my career for various uh, opportunities. And I've been through a lot of waves. So I believe was started my career when everything was closed source. And the answer was always, you're using it wrong. Uh, obviously, then we transitioned to open source. And then there was license types, GPL and BSD MIT, as Natalie was talking about. Um, then we went into a wave of foundations. Um, I personally think the jury is still out if they're actually valuable or not. Um, and then the last wave that we've been seeing is business licenses to prevent cloud providers from running it cheaper, because they always will be able to run it cheaper than you. But from my perspective, what that really means is, is what you're offering a silo or utility? Is it cloud or is it edge? You know, edge is my big thing. But if you're not a silo in the cloud and there's a value that you're running across multiple clouds and out to the edge, it's harder for a single cloud provider to take your stuff and run it cheaper. From a business plan perspective, build the ecosystem. That should be a given. All of our stuff, if it's OSS, you need a very, very large base to convert a small percentage of those over. I also believe there will never be another Red Hat. However, I really think it's good to start with a support model and target companies that have a requirement that says we have to have a support contract for anything we run in production. But you need a longer term plan. SaaS is good. Um, open Core has heard a lot, but I'm not a big believer if it looks like freemium enterprise. Um, I personally believe there's only three main models. Bundle it with hardware. There's a human psychology component to that. If it's something physical, they'll pay for it. Run it as a service, but again, uh, human psychology, if it's running as a service, people think they have to pay for it, unless it's too easy, then they can just run it themselves. And number three is augment with a service, and that's my play in what I call open core. I, do, I believe deeply in number three, and if applicable, number one, uh, the way you augment can be closed and drive IP for the company, which means valuation. But in the end, whether or not you're based on OSS or not, there's really only one thing that matters. Is the consumer biased that this should be free? Make sure to check on this from time to time because it can change. This happened to me. Find me later and I'll tell you what happened to me. Um, you can go from charging a penny to a dollar, but if the consumer bias is it should be free and that is the expectation, it's best to pack your bags and move on. All right. Uh, so you also had Natalie's, or uh, sorry, Natalie's, Alana's talk yesterday about um, Ready Set and how Ready Set works. 
I work at Ready Set. I'm a software engineer at Ready Set. Um, and I want to talk to you about pictures. Because um, I think if, if some of you remember that talk, there was a slide where we had a big list of like, here's all the ideas behind Ready Set. You know, we, we make this data flow graph and, you know, we compile to an AST and we, we have a DAG. And, and I think probably most of you are looking at that, that slide and sort of not really understanding what's going on. Um, and I think that's like pretty natural. Um, but as systems programming engineers, we just look at code all day. Um, sometimes if we're lucky, we'll have logs. Sometimes if we're really lucky, we'll have a debugger. Um, but I think like if that's all you're doing, if all you're doing is looking at logs, if all you're doing is you know, maybe putting some print statements in or running a debugger, it's tough to like really understand what's going on in your program. And I think that like the thing in my mind that a lot of systems programming is missing um, is pictures, right? So after that slide, Alana, you know, there were a couple more slides where we had, you know, diagrams with graphs and, you know, we were highlighting certain arrows. And I think for me watching that and probably for a lot of you watching that, that's when things really started to click. You really started to go, oh, I understand how the data is flowing through this system. And I think as complexity goes up, as you start to think about not just like, you know, where you're writing a function that's changing some data here and moving some things around there, um, as complexity goes up, the value of pictures goes up proportionally. Um, and there's this Twitter thread that I, I think about this a lot. Um, uh, there's this person uh, who's a, a Fastly engineer, actually, who um, did this whole thread. And I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but it talks a lot about this notion that systems should be able to dump their internal state um, as pictures. And you should be able to, I, I believe that any sufficiently complex system, I should be able to press a button and understand the shape of the data within that system as a picture, right? And like, right, making pictures is hard, right? It's like, it can go as high as like you're doing GUI programming or web development, um, but there's really good tools. I think the best tool is Graphiz. I think it's like horribly underutilized um, for just taking, you know, you can just do some string manipulation in your code spit out Graphviz, and then Graphviz will make a picture for you, right? Um, and the state of the art here, you know, this is, this is Postgres, right? That is not a picture, right? That is a, uh, that, you know, there's like a hierarchy there, there's arrows, there's, you know, you can sort of see, but like, it doesn't really make any sense to me. Um, what I can do in Ready Set, um, if I have a running Ready Set instance, I can run that command, and this is small because you know it's a big graph, but I get a picture of the data flow graph of the Ready Set instance, and I can see you know that where things start to get a little bit more complicated. I can see you know I can see the columns, I can see indexes, I can see types. Um, you can actually see up here. You get a sense. You can say, see how much data there is stored in individual nodes. As if I were to run a query, if I had more time, uh, you could see you know this uh, number lower in the graph, um, you know, sort of all the way at the reader node, you could see this zero go up to one as I, you know, started to load data. Um, this is the tool that I use the most when I'm debugging any query issue in Ready Set. It's the first thing that I do. It's, the, it's, it's crucial to my workflow, and I think more systems should be doing this. Uh, so make your system make pictures. Yay. Thanks, Natalie. Um, so I'm here to talk about why more people should be attending conferences like these. Um, systems, uh, you know, when, when we hear the word systems, there's a lot of black magic that shows up for a lot of people, particularly folks who've actually entered the industry in the past 10 to 15 years, uh, particularly on the web development side of things. Um, there's a reason why JavaScript is the most popular language in the world because it doesn't require you to have a very deep foundation in engineering or sciences or compilers to actually be productive, productive in, in terms of just putting uh, new products out. Um, and what that has led to, uh, you know, one of the unfortunate side effects uh, of that is 
that over the past um, decade or so, there's been this division that has actually started showing up between programmers versus engineers. Uh, you know, like just the coding part of it in order to put something out versus being able to design systems where you can predict how the system is actually going to be behaving. And the latter part, which is the engineering part, has started getting classified as systems or the dark magic part of it. Um, so I'm going to give you four reasons uh, why if, even if it seems like dark magic to you, uh, you should still be participating in conferences like these. Uh, the first one is you get to switch on your God board. Um, there is just so much hidden power uh, sitting in our machines and on the servers that doesn't get utilized because the people who are actually building on that hardware just do not know how to extract the fullest extent of it, simply because a lot of abstractions in the form of frameworks and libraries are actually sitting uh, in between the programmer and the hardware. Um, and a lot of those examples we heard in the you know in this conference, particularly from Tiger Beetle, um, you know, and some of the other folks. So uh, you get to build a lot more powerful systems than uh, you know what what we normally see and i think a good example of this is what the zik team has actually achieved like you know just with four people uh, i think you know what the the kind of thing that they've been able to produce so um, that's a god mode um, the second is coping with changes uh, the technology ecosystem is uh, in my biased opinion the fastest changing ecosystem Every week or probably every day, there's a new framework. Every month, there's a new language. And like, you know, it just goes on forever. And a lot of folks end up being significantly overwhelmed by it. But guess what? Beneath these layers of these abstractions, the foundations actually don't change as much. And I love how Andrew actually talked about how he defined systems uh, side of things as understanding what's actually happening beneath, uh, you know, beneath all the layers. So that actually helps us um, stay current with things without having to get overwhelmed. The third one is no labels. Front end, back end, all of these are labels that actually end up, ends up restricting us. Uh, so you know you don't get to face that. It ends up actually being less religious as well because you understand the technology instead of having a just a almost a religious bias in favor of it. So all of these are good reasons why you should actually uh, be you know, attending conferences like these. You get to understand the systems beneath, and it just opens up a lot more power available to us. Thank you so much.